So last time we sort of ended with, uh, well, we, we, we started out by exploring the care metric, which is the metric that describes a rotating black hole. Uh, it's built out of these quantities A, which is the ratio of the angular momentum around the phi axis to the mass, this delta, and this rho squared. And then what we uh, first and foremost looked at is various structures based on the value of A, okay? And so we can start by taking A equals zero, in which case we're not looking at a spinning black hole. And then what we find is for the solutions, for the horizons, we actually get R minus equals zero and R plus equals two dm. So hopefully you remember that there were two solutions for R being problematic. At any rate, uh, the R minus is just the singularity. This is the short show black hole. R plus just gives you two gm, which is the horizon of the black hole. And then we did this little trick where we said, if we look at the sine of delta, since that's the coefficient in front of the dr squared term, which has a sine, rho squared is always positive, okay? So the sine of delta actually determines the sine in front of that term in the metric, which basically determines whether you can move to greater or less than values of r, okay? If it's positive, then it's just a standard r term in the metric and you can move in either direction, but if it's negative, then it's acting more like time, and we know that you can only move in time in one direction, okay? So for the metric, or for the Schwarzschild case, delta's positive outside of the horizon, so you can move inwards or outwards, but inside of the horizon, delta's negative, and that's an indicator that you can only move in one direction, and it turns out to be towards the singularity, okay? Now this is the more generic spinning black hole. A squared is a little bit less, or it's less than G squared N squared, but it's greater than zero. In this case, the R plus and the R minus are separate from each other, and they're both greater than zero, okay? R equals zero still turns out to be a singularity, but as we talked about last time, it's no longer a point-like singularity, but rather it's a ring singularity, which I'm just drawing a cross-section of all this. So this is actually a circle. And then we have the R minus, the inner horizon, the R plus, the outer horizon. If we do the sine of delta analysis, we find that outside of R plus, we can move in or out. Once we're inside, we can only move in one direction. Now I've got this set here for a reason in just a moment. But once we get in here with the singularity, we can actually move in or out because delta is positive again. Of course, if we head out and we get to this region, we can only move in one direction, and that means once we head out, we have to go out. So that's why if you come in, you've got to go in. If you come in from the inside, you've got to go out. And we'll see an explanation of that in a few minutes. Okay. So that's what these two sets of in and out mean. Okay. For the extremal case, where a squared is equal to g squared m squared, we find that the horizons actually become degenerate. They're both at the value of gm. We still have that ring-like singularity, but what's really interesting is outside of the horizons, delta's positive, so you can move inwards or outwards. Inside of the horizons, delta's also positive, so you can move in or out. This does not at all seem like a black hole, but it is. And we'll explain why in just a moment. If a squared is bigger than g squared m squared, it's naked, okay? It's actually a naked singularity without any event horizons, okay? Now, we are going to argue later on that this is impossible, okay? So we won't even worry about this case. This is very special, this is quite common, and this is actually kind of special because most things in space are rotating to some degree, okay? So this is actually the most common black holes that you'll find. Then what we said was we want to draw the maximal extension. Instead of using the Crystal coordinates, we went ahead and jumped to the conformal or Penrose diagram. And the advantage of the Penrose diagram is that infinity is grabbed from infinitely far away and pulled into a finite distance. And so for Minkowski space, this represents the entirety of the space. We're suppressing theta and phi, obviously. The theta and phi are finite, so that doesn't really make it bigger. So your T and R end up looking something like this. You have all of these special regions. Remember, in this diagram, lines of 
sort of verticality are lines of constant r, whereas lines of some sort of horizontality are lines of constant t. This is t0, this is t minus infinity, t plus infinity. This is r0, and then a line that goes like this is r infinity, r goes to infinity. This is the time-like future of all particles that have mass. This is the light-like future of all paths that follow light cones. This is the light-like, sorry, the light-like future, the light-like past, the time-like past, and then this is the space-like future, okay? Anything traveling faster than the speed of light or to any distances which lie outside of the light cone go here, okay? This is the M4 example. Now I'm gonna take this same structure and I'm going to apply it to first the Schwarzschild black hole and then the Kerr black hole, okay? So we've already seen a maximally extended Schwarzschild black hole, but we use the Pascal coordinates. We should look at what that maximally extended Schwarzschild black hole looks like in terms of these Penrose coordinates. So first and foremost, for Schwarzschild, we have the following. Uh, first and foremost, outside of the black hole looks very similar to M4, because we know if we go far enough away from the black hole, the space becomes M4, okay? So it turns out that quite a bit of this is repeated from this story, where once again we have lines of constant R like this, okay? And I'm not gonna keep writing in R equals constant, just bear with me. Okay, now, there is a difference, though, because the r equals zero is hidden behind the horizon. And so if we are honest in our redefinition of the coordinates with respect to these Penrose coordinates, then we get something that looks like this, where this is actually r equals 2gm, and this happens to be r equals 2gm as well, okay? So all of these are lines of constant r, and then we have lines of constant t, which once again look like this. And then once again, any light cone drawn will open up at 45 degrees, because these are conformally related geometries, angles are preserved. So if you have 45 degree light cones in the Kruskal coordinates, which was the achievement of Kruskal diagrams, then you also have 45 degree light cones in this diagram, okay? Now, this was region one in our Kruskal diagram. We have region two, which is, let's get our butts inside the black hole. And in this case, it turns out that the black hole's interior is just marked by r equals zero, okay? And then it makes sense because outside of this horizon, you can move through the horizon if you want, or you can go off to time-like infinity, or sorry, time-like infinity is up here. Okay, you can't go to light-like infinity unless you're moving at speed of light, okay? But nonetheless, you can go here or you can go inside of the horizon. But once you're inside of the horizon, you have no choice. The only thing you can do is head towards r equals zero, the singularity, where you'll die. Okay? But what we notice is that this is not geodesically complete. One can ask, if I have a path which is going here, where did that come from? Well, it came out of r equals 2gm. Well, what was inside of r equals 2gm? This one down here. Well, it turns out that this picture gets completed by basically the following. Okay? So again, this is also r equals zero. This guy corresponds to a black hole, this guy corresponds to a white hole, and this is, of course, the other asymptotic M4, okay? So we have M4 here, 
And here we have M4, ah, I don't know, let's give it another name. It's a different, it's a separate copy of asymptotic space time than on our side. Clearly, you can start out in the white hole and lead to either of these, but once you've picked one of these, you can't go to the other one. You can't get from here to here or from here to here. Okay? So this is the Penrose diagram representation of the Kreskal diagram that we use to maximally extend the Schwarzschild black hole. Pretty cool, huh? Yes? I'm sorry, what's the symbol that you're writing for the time like MDD? The I? No, the J? Yeah, it's, it's J. I, I didn't okay. pick it. It's the standard notation. It's a script J. Okay. Yeah, sorry about it. So, so I guess technically it would look like this or something like that. I don't know. <laughs> I'm not much of a cursor writer anymore. I hate it when they do that. And they could just call that like future something. I don't know. At any rate, okay, so I want you to notice something. Here R was vertical. Here R is horizontal. Okay? You can actually note that because here the coefficient in front of the dr squared term in the metric is always positive. In M4, the dr squared term is always positive. Here, though, in the Schwarzschild metric, if you can remember, inside of the horizon, the sign of the dr squared term is negative. So what we can say is that this is a time-like singularity. It's time-like. This is a space-like singularity. It's going to be important in a few minutes. Okay? In particular, notice when something is time-like, you can move away from it, or you can move towards it or away from it. I mean, you know, if something's time-like, and you have to travel in a light tunnel, you can move towards it or away from it. However, if something is space-like, you got no choice. Does that make sense? So it's time-like here, which makes sense because you can go to r equals zero or away from r equals zero if you're just in four-dimensional Minkowski space. But once you're inside of the horizon of the black hole, you must go towards r equals zero. Okay? Does that make sense? Because I'm about to use that extensively. Okay, good. Here we go. Now what we want to do is we want to ask, what about Kim? Jeez, I can't wonder these things. Oh, okay. Well, here we go. Four pair. Whew. Turns out, for care, we've got a couple of different possibilities. This one is obviously just that picture of the Schwarzschild. Okay? Now we want to go to this case. A is less, A squared is less than G squared M squared. So, if we have a squared is less than g squared n squared, first and foremost, recall that rho squared, and I have it up here, rho squared is equal to r squared plus a squared cosine squared theta. Okay? Rho equals zero is the singularity. But for rho to be zero, you need r to be zero and you need theta to be pi over two. Okay, you need both of those things to be true. Okay, so this means if we want to do a maximal extension of the geometry, we're going to get different results if we have theta equals pi over 2 versus when theta is not pi over 2. So we'll start with the theta equals pi over 2 case. And in this case, r equals 0 is a singularity. And then we will move on to the theta not equal to pi over 2 over case, where r equals 0 is not singular. OK? So here we go. Are you ready? First and foremost, we know that if you get far enough away from the black hole, it should look like this. It's only as you get near the horizon that things get screwy. OK? So we can go ahead and assign the standard light like future, light like past, and space like past. Okay? And of course, lines of constant R are like so. 
Now we can pass through the outer horizon. And I'm going to go ahead and draw this here. And what is interesting is that now the lines of constant R, because delta is less than zero in this region between the outer and the inner horizon, lines of constant R should be horizontal. Okay? So what we can actually do is we can build up a region here. Okay, so if I pass through the outer horizon, I'm here. I must go to the inner horizon. That's R minus. Remember, I said, when you're outside, you can go either way. So if we think about a light cone here, I can go to I, sorry, I zero, or sorry, I plus. If I think about a light cone outside of the black hole, I can either go to the time-like future infinity, or I can go into the black hole. But once I'm in the black hole, I must go towards the inner horizon, R minus. That's this argument right here. Does that make sense? Okay, good. Notice we haven't got the singularity yet. We've got to go through the inner horizon. So let's go through the inner horizon. If I go through the inner horizon, then what I find is this. That is, inside of the inner horizon, R equals zero is now time-like. But that should make sense. Because in this case, you can move towards the singularity or you can move away. And this is illustrated in these diagrams by a vertical R equals zero. Okay? Does that make sense? So once again, if I'm inside of here, I can choose to go into the singularity or I can turn around and go back out. Wait a minute. Hold on. If I go in, if I just hang out, you know, I'm just going to look at a black hole for the rest of my life. But if I decide to jump in, I'll have to go into the black hole, into the inner horizon. I can die in the singularity if I want. Or I can turn around and go out. But once I'm here, I must leave. I mean, this is the region between our inner and our outer, our minus and our plus. That's this region right here. Okay, that's our plus on the outside, our minus on the inside. So I just argued that I can go inside the inner horizon, and if I want to, I can turn around and leave. When I get here, shouldn't I be in the same place I was here? The answer is no, because you can only move up on this diagram. Where are you going to go? You're going to go to another copy. But once you're in here, you are between R minus and R plus. And once you're here, you have to leave. You have to pass through R plus. Where's it going to take you? It's going to take you to another copy of the asymptotic universe. Think about that for a moment. I said you can enter the black hole, enter into the inner horizon, and then turn around and leave if you want. 
However, what we thought was that you can enter and then leave back to the space where you started. That is not the story. You enter from this asymptotic copy of M4 in the black hole. When you exit, you exit to a different asymptotic copy of M4. Pretty weird, huh? It gets weirder. Because we've got all these things which are not connected to anything. We should connect them. Here we go. First and foremost, we have this. And then we have a region here with an r equals zero singularity. And then once we leave this, Asymptotic universe, asymptotic universe, asymptotic universe, asymptotic universe. You want to hear the bad news? We can't end here. Rather, what we can do is we can just take this diagram to here and just stick it here and then stick another one below it. So what we are finding is in maximally extending the Schwarzschild solution, we ended up having to have a second copy of the asymptotic universe. It was required in the maximal extension. When we maximally, maximally extend a rotating black hole, we end up with an infinite number of asymptotic universes. That's an interesting possibility. I do not have an answer because for them to loop back in, you have to imagine that they're embedded in some space time. Actually, also, if they did loop back in, then causality would be in danger because you could have an event, it could travel around and then change the causes of the event. It's an interesting possibility, which I wouldn't deny. Okay. okay? But the generic picture is it's an infinite power of these things. Pretty weird, huh? Kind of strange. All right, so now let's just very quickly go through the analogous picture when r is equal to zero and theta is not equal to pi over two. And remember, in this case, we will not encounter the singularity. Okay, so this is what life looks like when you're floating around in pi theta not equal pi over two. In this case, we have the external universes. with all the usual markings and analogous markings over here. When we pass through R plus, we end up in the region where R goes this way. So we have to go through R minus. And when we get through R minus, it turns out that in this case, r equals zero is again a vertical line, but it's not singular. Here, these r equals zeros are singular, so when you hit them, you're done. Your geodesic stops when you hit a singularity. Here, though, r equals zero is not a singularity. You can pass through r equals zero, and you find yet another external universe. Same goes for here. All right. And then you can just take these and copy them on and on and on. Okay? So once again, we get an infinite copy of these things, which is similar to what we get here. But in the theta not equals pi over 2 case, there's no singularity for you to hit. This is kind of like going into the black hole and then going through this ring. If you go into the black hole, and go through the ring, that is passing here, okay? All right, so, so now what I wanna do is I wanna do the extremal case. 
So let's do a squared equals g squared m squared. And the extremal case turns out to be relatively simple. First of all, we have the usual suspects. And then once we're in this region, it turns out that the r equals zero singularity is once again time-like. You can move towards or away from it. But this is the single radius curve the horizon, r equals, or r equals gm, not pgm. Okay, in the extremal case, the inner and the outer horizons have the same value. So if I'm external, I can move away from it, or I can move into it. Once I'm into it, I can move towards the singularity, or I can move away from the singularity and leave the black hole. But if I leave the black hole, I do not return to where I started. Rather, I enter another copy of the external universe. So once again, I just want to reinforce this. We thought there's no way this is a black hole because you can enter or leave, enter or leave. Okay? There's no horizon. There is a horizon. And it does have a one-way effect. If you enter this thing and then leave it, you're going to a different copy of the asymptotic universe. And of course, this story continues. Okay? Pretty weird, huh? Did you know there was an infinite number of universes? Now, um, obviously, as I told you last time, these maximal extensions are not relevant because star black holes were born. They were born from stellar collapse. And our universe has a finite age. These require an infinite age. Okay? So these pictures are, they're nice, they're very, very interesting, but they're not physically relevant. However, and I ended with this last time, general relativity is a theory which should be valid on any geometry that you induce. So you could say the universe is infinitely old and it was born or it, it, it just has this infinite black hole. And in that case, these maximal extensions apply and general relativity should be able to accurately describe, consistently describe all of what's going on. It turns out if you add quantum mechanics to that story, things get very, very interesting. Okay? So I won't go through that again, but, but the quantum mechanical part of this becomes very interesting. And these are, these are some of the arenas where we try to look at the integration of quantum mechanics and general relativity, which generally doesn't work. Okay? But in some of these situations, you can get some insight into, okay, how is it going to go together? All right, any questions before we now bust into today's topics? No questions? All right. So today, I'm going to go over, oh man. I'm gonna go over, I'll keep care up there just in case, but uh, I'm gonna go over a few uh, important uh, conjectures and conclusions. I'm not gonna prove anything. That's gonna take too long. So this is going to be a very, a uh, heuristic version of things versus a mathematical version. We'll do a little bit of math. But let's start with uh, singularity theorems. Okay? Now, one of the important things about a black hole forming is you can imagine if a star started to collapse, you know, as long as everything is headed straight towards what will eventually be the singularity, then everything going to the singularity would work out and it would just form a black hole, okay? However, you know, you can kind of imagine that as the star starts to collapse, you've got all these other forces in play, so you don't just have the attractiveness of gravity, you've got nuclear forces and 
electromagnetic and all this, and you can imagine that things might start collapsing, but not quite perfectly radially. And in fact, you know, as you collapse, you get larger and larger momentum, but maybe you miss other things and you end up, you know, collapsing, but also expanding, okay? Now, this would not give you a black hole. This would. So the question is, do you need a perfect spherical symmetry of collapsing stuff in order to get a black hole? Seems like if you have a perfectly symmetric, spherically symmetric distribution of mass and it collapses, it will collapse to a point, which is the singularity of a black hole. If you have a non-uniform, a non-spherically symmetric, I mean, it's a sphere, but it's not spherically symmetric exactly, and it collapses, do you get a black hole? The answer is yes. How so? Because Penrose and Hawking developed the idea of what are called trapped surfaces, okay? where essentially in the collapse of a stellar interior, they realized that a surface will form and anything that's inside of that surface is redirected to R equals zero. So there is a sense in which the trapped surface is a lot like the event horizon. However, here's the important difference. The trapped surface will exist before the singularity exists. And the trapped surface will grow. So in the formation of a black hole, before the singularity, you get a trapped surface. Once things are inside of the trapped surface, they have to move to R equals zero. The trapped surface grows and when the singularity at the center forms, the trapped surface gets to the event horizon of the black hole. Here's what's interesting. General relativity does not work at a singularity. You can't, I mean, it's infinite curvature. You can't use Einstein's equation. However, this trapped surface forming before the singularity, that's completely allowed to use general relativity to describe it. So Hawking and Penrose found these trapped surfaces are the argument for why non-spherically symmetric sources can collapse to a point, even though they're not perfectly spherically symmetric. Does that make sense? The trapped surfaces, you might think of them as event horizons, but they're not quite. They do grow and eventually become the event horizon, but they're not the event horizon until they reach that point because they're not cloaking a singularity until they get to the event horizon radius, okay? So those are singularity theorems. Of course, I mean, this is one of the most interesting things about general relativity, right? I don't know if you figured this out, but this is a broken part of general relativity. General relativity predicts that singularities exist, but general relativity can't be applied to a singularity. So general relativity produces its own shortcomings, which is interesting. I mean, we've got to solve it, we've got to fix it. And I guarantee you quantum mechanics is going to play an important role in that. Because a singularity is the smallest link scale you can imagine, and that's where quantum mechanics is the most important. Okay? So general relativity predicts its own problem. Okay? And we have to fix it by adding something to it. Now, there's another theorem, or a conjecture. It is called the cosmic Censorship, censorship conjecture. Which says collapsing objects are never Remember, a naked singularity is a singularity which does not have an event horizon around it. The, the reason we say naked is because if you have a naked singularity, you can literally go as close to it and look at it as you want and then turn around and go away. But if the singularity of a black hole is surrounded by an event horizon, there's no doing that. 
If you want to see the singularity, you got to get inside the horizon and you're going to meet the singularity and die with the singularity. Okay? The cosmic censorship conjecture says for collapsing objects, stars turning into black holes, you are always, always going to have an event horizon. Now this is unproven, but it's well supported, and we'll see an example of it, if we can get to it today. Okay? Now, I want to point out something. This is referring to collapsing objects. Stars collapsing into black holes. If we had a singularity which did not come from collapse, it could be naked. Naked. I like naked. Open this out. Can anyone imagine what singularity does not come from collapse and could be naked? Potentially the Big Bang? It's the Big Bang. The Big Bang is a naked singularity. Okay, but we'll talk about that when we get to cosmology. Okay, then we have the Noah Hare theorem. And the no-hair theorem basically says stationary, and I want to put all the important words that matter, stationary, asymptotically flat, black holes are completely, and the word completely is very important here, characterized by the mass, the charge, and the angular momentum. Kind of interesting. If I have two black holes and I would like to compare them, instead of wondering which star collapsed into this black hole and which star collapsed into that black hole, the only three numbers I need to know are the masses of the black holes, the charges of the black holes, and the angular momentum of the black holes. Yes? When you talk about how mass and uh, angular momentum are coming into play, are we like talking about how charge comes into play? So, the... so that's, that's rather interesting. So charge, so the charge, the charge black hole solution which can include the rotational component, is generally called the Reisner-Nordstrom metric. It is something I used to cover in this course. It turns out that much of what you can do with the Reisner-Nordstrom metric for charged black holes, like the, the maximal extension is infinite towers of, of asymptotic universes, the same details play out in the care. So I prefer to talk about the care. The other reason for that is the charged black holes are not physically relevant. Any large quantity of stuff is electrically neutral. Okay. This is just a playground where you can say, well, suppose it had a huge electrical field, okay? Then, or, or sorry, electric, electric, net electric charge. Then that actually deforms things. Now there is a complicating factor in charged black holes, and that is that this is important, not just for general relativity, but also for no, it's charged. Electromagnetism. Yeah, so when you solve this metric for a charged black hole, you have to also make sure that you've got Maxwell's equations in the curved space solved. So proving the solution here is much more complicated than just a good old spinning black hole, because that's just general relativity and nothing else. Okay? So you might think, damn, I want to see the charged black hole. Well, you have, actually. It's on your homework. And you will, because I'm gonna add a problem without it. Okay? But you've actually, it's one of, it's it's actually a part of one of the questions that I've already assigned you. You just didn't realize it. And there's a good reason why you wouldn't. Okay? But at any rate, okay, so these three numbers quantify a black hole. They are the only three numbers. That means if Am I 
works so much better in my notes. Yeah, I'm drawing them with skinny legs. But at any rate, if I take a cow, and why wouldn't I take a cow? Okay? And I collapse it to a black hole. This is, of course, a complex cow. He will become a perfect sphere. This is a perfect spherical cow. And I'm saying this because this cow has a ton of information. It's got a name. It's got its spot pattern. It's got its size. Okay, it's got its shape. It's got all this information. If you collapse it into a black hole, the only thing it's going to have are these three pieces of information. This is a representation of what we call information loss. This plays a huge role in quantum mechanics, but it also plays a huge role in the notion of entropy, which we're going to maybe get to today. Okay? But let's move on. There is also the area theorem. Hawking pointed out that assuming this is Hawking's area theorem. Assuming the weak energy condition, and there are actually a host of energy conditions which are defined in the book, and I used to define them in the class, and then we never used them, so I'll just tell you what the weak energy theorem is, and, and we'll just leave it at that. But the weak energy condition is essentially uh, the statement that Rho, the energy density contribution to the energy momentum tensor, that rho is positive. Okay, which kind of makes sense. You know, energy should be positive. Okay? So as long as the energy density is positive, then the area of an event horizon can never increase. Okay. Now, there's a sense in which this should be obvious, right? Because if we take the mass of a black hole, and we increase it by letting something enter into the horizon, okay? So if we have a black hole of a given mass and something enters the horizon, that thing is now part of the black hole. It can't escape. So if we add in some delta m to the mass, if it's a Schwarzschild black hole, then we know that the horizon radius, which is 2gm, okay, will become 2gm plus 2g delta m. Okay? Well, it's a sphere. So if I increase the mass of the black hole by throwing something in, can't get anything out. If I throw something in, then the radius gets bigger, so the area gets bigger. Okay? For the Schwarzschild case, that's trivial. For the Kerr case, not so. Okay, and we will look at that. Say it again. You might try to decrease, right? I might try to decrease? You, you have to decrease. You can't decrease, but you won't increase. Oh, sorry. Uh, oh, sorry, sorry. Uh, yeah, you're right. Thank you. 
Thank you. I appreciate it. Okay? All right. Now, I got to give you a technical feature, okay, which is just bear with me. Um, energy and momentum. black holes. Well, this is kind of weird, right? Because we talked about how to go about finding, for example, defining the momentum of a particle that's moving. It used to be mass times its forward velocity. When we know how to define energy, we basically take the metric, we find the killing vectors. There's usually a killing vector associated with the invariance of translations in time. And then we combine that with an arbitrary form momentum, and then whatever that gives us is the energy of the system. That's how we define the energy of a particle moving through a curved geometry. In flat space, energy is just the time-like component of the form momentum vector. In a curved geometry, it's a little bit more complicated. Okay. However, we might wonder, what is the energy and momentum of a black hole? I mean, <laughs> black holes are not point-like objects, which you know, they have a form of all that stuff, okay? So it turns out that to identify the energy and momentum of a black hole, what we can do is we can utilize something called a Cobar integral, and we're not going to worry about it. I just want to show you something interesting. So Cobar integrals utilize the killing vectors associated with the space in order to generate the conserved quantities associated with them. And so if we take K mu, as the killing vector for time independence, okay? And remember, all of the geometries that I've done, the Kerr black hole, the Schwarzschild black hole, four-dimensional Minkowski space, those are all time independent, okay? They're not all static, or they are static, but they're not all stationary. The Kerr is spinning, so it's got that d phi dt term, but all the coefficients don't depend on time, okay? So this is a universal symmetry. And we find, using this and the Komar integral formalism, that, and this is important, for four-dimensional Minkowski space, the energy is zero. Now I'm talking about the energy of the entire space, the entire geometry. You can separately define the energy of a particle moving through the geometry using the standard killing vector contracted with the four momentum. But this is using a Komar integral to figure out the energy of a space, and we're not going to go through the Komar formalism. Okay? Now here's where it gets interesting. For a Schwarzschild black hole, if I have just a single Schwarzschild black hole and an infinite if I get far away from it, just flat space, everywhere, that's what I'm talking about, then the energy of that space is just equal to the mass of the black hole. Okay? Make sense? Here's an interesting one. Uh, yeah? So, does that energy kind of represent Sorry, say it again. So, well, what does the energy mean for the space? What does the energy mean for a space? Um, so, <clears throat> one, <laughs> one area where it's relevant, um, so first, first of all, there is the positive energy theorem, which was produced by Witten, which said that um, all space-times uh, should be of positive energy, period. Okay? Then you have the story where you want to add in, uh, what is that, what is the name of that? Semi-classical quantum mechanics effects. And when you add in semi-classical quantum mechanics effects to the story, this is not truly quantizing gravity. This is just adding in some quantum mechanical effects, for example, like tunneling. Then it turns out that you can tunnel from one version of space-time to another version of space-time. 
But the tunneling requires the energies of the two space times that you're tunneling from and into to be the same. Of course, once you tunnel into a new space time, it might time evolve. Okay, but the tunneling energies have to be the same. So that's where energy becomes <coughs> important. Does that help at all? I think a little bit. Yeah, I mean, <coughs> so I, 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 I wish I had the Komar formalism on the tip of my brain because I could probably lay it out to you and it might make more sense, but you can always look it up. But essentially, a Kobar integral is an integral over all of space-time, okay? And you're finding that it gives you zero for m, four, and it gives you just the single source mass that's in the space that it is di different from it being m, four, for the case of a Schwarzschild black hole. Now, here's the surprising part. For a Kerr black hole, you might expect that the energy of the space-time would depend on both the mass of the black hole and its angular momentum, right? Because if I have something which is sitting there which has a mass, it's got a certain amount of energy, rest mass energy, but if I give it motion, then that motion should contribute to the energy, right? Does that make sense? I mean, if I take a particle and it's sitting still, it's got a rest mass energy, but if I kick it and make it go, it's also got a kinetic energy, okay? Here's the thing. Using these Kovar integrals, the energy of a pure black hole is determined entirely in terms of the mass of the black hole. It's a little counterintuitive. And that's actually a result that we'll use in due time. Okay. Of course, for the Kerr black hole, we can take the killing vector associated with rotations around the phi axis, and this will give us the angular momentum of the black hole as a conserved quantity. Okay. All right. Now, um, oh boy. I don't know how much of this I can get through, but I'll just see. Okay, so really and truthfully, the only thing from this story that you need to know is that the energy of a rotating black hole only depends on the mass. The energy doesn't depend on the angular momentum. Okay? Now, let's go back to the care geometry and let's ask, what about the over-extreme Kerr black hole. That is, a black hole with angular momentum squared larger, or the ratio of the angular momentum to the mass squared larger than g squared m squared. Okay, this gives us a naked black hole. If this can be satisfied. Okay, now we might ask, can this happen? And it turns out that in binary star systems, where you can get like an accumulation disk, it's actually quite easy to ramp up the angular momentum of a black hole. And it actually turns out that it's fairly easy to get to very, very close to, if not at, the extremal black hole case, okay? Remember, if it's slowly rotating, then a squared is less than g squared m squared. That's a normal rotating black hole. This is a very special extremal version of that. Okay. What I'm telling you is that this can commonly exist. So the question is, if this can exist, is there anything we can do to get this? Okay. So what might we do? Well, all we have to do so we've got this rotating black hole, okay? All we have to do is we have to find a piece of mass whose angular momentum, and I'm just gonna call it a small piece of mass, that's what the delta means, it's just the angular momentum of a small thing. The angular momentum of it is larger than the mass. 
Okay? If this turns out to be true, then if I throw this into the black hole, this will become this. The angular momentum is going to be larger than the mass. And there's all these you know, connecting coefficients that we're just going to ignore. A is basically a measure of the angular momentum, as is J. Okay, remember, A is defined as J over M, or L over M, it doesn't matter. Okay? So if I've got something which is extremal, it's satisfying this condition, all I have to do is find something which has larger angular momentum than mass and throw it in. Do these things exist? Yes, hell yes. You can have your angular momentum be much larger than your mass. Okay? And again, we're, we've taken natural coefficients, so you know, that's the only reason I can compare the angular momentum to the mass. Normally you say angular momentum, it's got different units than mass, but all of the units of these quantities are the same after we've adopted natural units. So the angular momentum of something can definitely be larger than its mass. So if we throw this into the black hole, it goes from here to here. Does that make sense? And here's the rule. You can't do that. It turns out that you cannot take something like this and throw it into the black hole. If you try and throw this into the black hole, it will always stab it. And think about it. To increase the angular momentum of the black hole, or of the piece you're trying to throw in, sorry. First of all, if it's got a fixed mass, it's got a fixed mass. Okay? So what you want to do is, given the mass of the particle, you want to increase the angular momentum such that the angular momentum is larger than the mass. To increase the angular momentum, though, increasing this, is done by increasing sort of the r perpendicular component of its trajectory or the speed. Those are two ways to increase the angular momentum. But if you think about it, if you're increasing, you can't just, obviously, if you throw this straight towards the black hole, it's going to have zero angular momentum. So you have to throw it with some sort of angular motion or some sort of, you know, not radial motion, okay? To increase this to be larger than delta n, you have to either increase the speed of it or you have to increase the r perpendicular. That's basically the, the deflection from where you start, okay? But these two effects are clearly going to make it harder and harder to get it to go into the black hole. And it turns out that this is the critical limit to even getting it to go into the black hole. Does this make sense? Yeah? What about for something that's like spinning around its own axis? I mean, so like... Um, that is an interesting question that I'll have to think I do not have an answer for you off the top of my head. Yeah, I'll have to think about that. Okay, so at any rate, the point is that the uh, uh, sorry, the blah, blah, blah. basically, if we if we are studying the code geometries, we are never going to encounter this. Okay, we can get to the extremal case, but we can't go beyond it. But this is basically an example of the cosmic censorship conjecture, because if you could achieve this, then your singularity would be naked you can't get there. The best you can do is get here, but this still has a horizon. Okay? All right. So now, and we'll see what we can do with this in 15 minutes. 
Turns out the care geometry has got another important feature, which is going to play a very important role. Okay? Consider an object at rest outside of the outer horizon of the black hole. Okay, so this is a care geometry that I'm going to focus on. So if an object is at rest outside of the black hole, then we know that the form momentum of the object only has the time-like piece. Because the space-like piece is just this, the relativistic momentum, but it's at rest, so that's zero. So you only have the time-like piece, okay? Where this is, of course, t, r, theta, and b, the coordinates that we're using for the metric. Now, remember that u mu, u mu, which since we only have one component here, is basically equal to g0, 0, 0, u0, u0. Okay, the metrics only got, or sorry, the, the vectors here only have one piece. So the only component of the metric that we use is g0, 0, 0. Well, there's g0, 0, 0. So I can write this as minus, 1 minus 2 g m r over rho squared u0 squared. What is this equal to other than this expression? It's equal to minus 1. That was a good guess, though. So it's always equal to minus one. That's because we're parameterizing the path in terms of the length of the path. Okay? Oh, shit. Anybody notice anything interesting? If one minus t This is less than one. Hold on a second. I don't think this should be less than one. This should be less than zero. I think this is zero, but I could be wrong. It's written in my notes as a one, but hopefully it's zero. At any rate, if this term is less than zero, then there's no way this equation works. Does everybody see that? This is positive. That's a minus. That's a minus. One is positive. If this is negative, then you've got a neg you've got a positive number equals a negative number. That doesn't work, right? So what we can say is. If this is true, then an object cannot be at rest. Because this result is just, it's just based on this assumption that an object is at rest. If I added in some non-zero momentum, it'll change the story radically. Okay? So now we can ask, well, you know, hold on. I know what it, you know, I know the black hole, it's, it's, it's got this outer radius, R plus, and it's got this inner radius, R minus, and then there's a singularity inside, and you can move in, you can move out, and when you're in here, you can only move in. Obviously, we're just talking about inside of R plus, right? 
Turns out, no, it's just a different radius. Okay? The radius that this actually corresponds to is called the ergosphere radius. And it depends on theta, and it's given by gm plus the square root of g squared m squared plus minus a squared cosine squared theta. Okay? Which you can compare with r plus, which is gm plus the square root of g squared m squared minus a squared. So this is definitely a different radius. They, it is degenerate with r plus at the top and the bottom, okay, when theta is equal to zero or pi. But it is larger for other angles theta. So this is the ergosphere radius. Now the ergosphere radius is not a horizon radius. No one is saying once you've moved in here, you can't move out. You can move out. The definition of the ergosphere is that if you're inside of the ergosphere radius, it is impossible to be at rest. Okay? Anywhere outside of the ergosphere radius, you can sit at rest. I mean, you gotta use thrusters or whatever because you've got a gravitational attraction of a black hole. You move towards it if you don't have anything else, but you can turn a thruster on away and sit at rest, right? But in the ergosphere, no. You cannot sit at rest, all right? You can move outwards or inwards, but you just can't sit at rest. This effect is often called frame dragging, okay? And there is yet another important aspect of this ergosphere. So let's consider the killing vector associated with time independence of the metric, okay? And if we combine the killing vector or its dual with the four momentum of an object, then what we find is minus m the mass of the object times 1 minus 2g mr over rho squared dt d tau minus m naught 2g mr over rho squared d phi d tau. And this is, of course, the energy of the particle, or the mass, or whatever. This is not the energy of the whole universe. This is just the energy of a particle that you might want to throw into it. And this we're going to take to be minus E naught. Okay? The negative here is chosen so that E goes to M naught dt d tau which is greater than zero as r goes to infinity. Okay? So if you just look at this and take the limit that r goes to infinity, of course r is buried in the definition of rho and so forth, but if you take r goes to infinity, then to identify this as a positive energy for the particle, you need to put a minus there. That minus is important. That's why I'm arguing for it. Okay? But this, is, this makes sense. If you go far enough away from the black hole, all you've got is a particle in flat space. And if it's got an energy, the energy's positive. That's all we're saying, okay? Now, this means that E naught is M naught, one minus two G M R over rho squared, DT D tau, plus M naught, 2g m a r over rho squared d phi d tau. Oh, sorry, I missed a, I didn't factor a in here. I should have factored a in here. Uh, d phi d tau. Okay? Now, here's something interesting. A has the same sign as d phi d tau. A is the angular momentum, d phi d tau is the angular trajectory of the object that you're throwing in. So 
So these have the same sign. M naught is positive, two is positive, G is positive, N is positive, R is positive, Rose is positive, everything else is positive. So this whole term is positive, exactly. Okay? This term can be positive or negative. It's positive if you're outside of the aerosphere. And it's negative if you're inside of the ergosphere. Okay? Now, what does this mean? Well, this is something interesting. If you're outside of the ergosphere, then this is positive and this is positive, so your energy positive. Okay? If you are inside of the ergosphere, then E naught can be plus or minus. It can be positive or negative. Now let's make an interesting observation. Suppose you're in the ergosphere and your energy happens to be negative. Can you leave? I'm covering it up. If you're inside of the ergosphere and your energy is negative, can you leave the ergosphere? Well, if you're outside of the ergosphere, your energy must be positive. So no, you can't leave. If you're inside of the ergosphere and you have positive energy, you can leave. But if you have negative energy, you are stuck. Doesn't mean you have to go to the black hole, but you can't leave the ergosphere. Okay? All right. I think I'm going to go ahead and stop there. But let me just give you an interesting advertisement for where this is going to be taken. This idea of the ergosphere as a place where you can have negative energy and positive energy, but the negative energy can't leave, is going to lead us to the idea, wait a minute, if I feed the ergosphere a positive energy thing, and then inside of the ergosphere, it breaks up into two pieces, one of which is positive energy and one of which is negative energy, which you can do. They just have to add up to the original energy that you put in. Then the positive energy piece can leave the ergosphere, and the negative energy piece is trapped. Right? Here's the thing. The positive energy piece that leaves the ergosphere how is it compared to the energy that you put into it? Greater. It's greater. This gives us a way of taking energy away from a black hole. Because when we put a positive energy piece into the ergosphere and it breaks up into a negative and a positive piece, the positive piece can leave the negative piece is stuck, that positive energy piece is carrying the energy that the negative piece is giving to the black hole, it's carrying it away. We're actually reducing the energy of a black hole. This leads to what seems like the possible violation of the area theorem. I mean, after all, we're reducing the total mass of the black hole. Remember, the energy of a black hole is determined entirely in terms of the mass. We will find next time that this is still true, although it's not at all obvious how. Okay? I'll see you guys next Tuesday.